Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of stories from across the internet. In this series, we'll be focusing on a web novel called There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video, we'll be doing chapters 45 to 47. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. There is no epic lucha, only puns, chapter 45, new point of view. Talta felt like she was falling into a very warm ocean. Like an orange comet, she crashed into the depths of a pulsating ocean. The water rose and she fell, and the dusty spires of rock flushed with a sudden lush greenery and corals. The waters flowed with the creatures that were not quite ocean appropriate or quite understandable. Delta fell deeper and the darkness shifted. A light at the bottom of his void pulsed as Delta drew near. Hello, she called, her fingers splayed out and creating the streams and disturbances as she moved closer. The glowing pearl simply gleamed in the dark sand, the light coming from within him, and it felt warm even from a distance. Delta tried to remember how the ocean was now around her. The mime, the hunger, the contract. It felt like a simple jigsaw puzzle where she could align all the pieces to make up a picture from a sensible reason for it all. The mime had hit the accept button and now Delta was in an alien ocean. It made no sense yet Delta felt calm. Nervous, sure, but not panicky. The fear simply washed away in the gentle currents here. The pearl pulsed and more life escaped to its surface. A crab, some eel, a bird, a horse. Orange dust fell like snow from the surface above, and the pearl drew them in with pulses and inhalation. Delta drew closer and the flash of white and black marked eyes reflected on the surface of the pearl before the image was gone as quickly as it came. Delta inhaled and the ocean, and it tasted old and yet not treacherous. She had a hand in the pearl, and the calm absence of fear persisted. It was then that she noticed she had skin, pink and somewhat pale. Skin, fingers with nails. Delta looked down and saw the real hand on the other arm. She could see her shirt. The pearl glowed again, and then the ocean was gone. A familiar scene appeared, and Delta stood in front of the far less faded purple and orange circus tent. That looked around and she saw that it wasn't a cave where she had found it, but some rocky hill. Lights danced from the tent, and the night sky above danced with an ocean of stars, in the shapes and the clouds that made Delta feel so small that she inhaled and wanted just to hold the image tight. She had not seen the sky in what felt like a very long time. Noise distracted her and people appeared from the line of trees near the bottom of the hill. Delta felt the first dab of startlement as the burry man's face looked blurred, and the baldy developed picture. One of them cursed and it sounded like an underwater. Delta looked around and saw that some of the trees didn't look quite right, unfinished in some manner. The stars above them seemed to rearrange themselves as if not quite happy with where they were. The two men called out, and a few words making it to Delta. Run, go, us, la, la, me, get the cheeky bugger. And one man go forth and carried a cage between them. Delta moved back as if the men would stop and stare at her or demand to know who she was. But they moved past, flickering in and out of reality, clothes not quite solid, as if the style changed slightly every second. Delta felt confused by the scene until she saw the thing in the cage, a near-naked creature with barely enough skin or muscle to form anything human. It snapped and snarled with an exposed mouth, a tiny pointy teeth and black gums. It looked around and dealt her, and in her head applied white paint to the creature and a hat. It was the mime, but it wasn't a mime in the scene. Someone poked her and dealt her screeched, flying forward as if the touch had burned her. She spun and saw the mime standing there behind her, fully grown and mimey. It put a finger to its thin lips and pointed. Delta slowly followed its finger to see a much more defined man leaning over the cage. A rather slender figure, the man twirled a very elegant moustache and smiled. His black trousers and bright cherry red suit and top made him striking figure. An interesting fellow, caught snacking on our ex-sword swallower. He finished with his wins as if not wanting to dwell on the idea. 
One of the men said something and pulled out the sword. The young mime screeched and rattled the cage with a feeble strength. It just looked so thin, just like how Delta had found him. The red man frowned and snapped the sword out of the blurry man's hands, scoffing. Clearly, someone needs to spend some time cleaning the tyrant ape's bedding. Go get to it. He'll return after hunting soon and he does not like to be disturbed when eating. The man sniffed and scolded man, ducked his head, moving into the unfinished part of the world. The mime moved forward to examine his younger self in the cage. Still shrieking, Delta could definitely see much more masculine features now that his body had fooled out and lost the sickening gaunt appearance. It had been what she had found him. His strange, pale and smooth face had not changed, but his throat and arms seemed to fill out and then thicken. Not exactly muscular, but he had a wiry feel to him and actually fit his suit now. The mime moved on and stood next to the red man and bowed his head. The red man's hand moved through the mime as he talked like a ghost. Now, I know what you need, my young friend. The man chuckled and pulled out a wrapped package from his pocket. Now, I was going to give this to my other beasties, but I think that you should use some cheering up, my little ghoul friend. He smiled and opened the package. A purple steak resting in the crinkled paper and the smell made the young mime pause in its fearful screaming. It sniffed and without eyes locked on the meaty easily. Go on, the circus has had worse things than you, my friend. Don't be shy. He encouraged and put the meat near the cage, and withdrew his hand. The young mime pounced on it, snarling and chomping like an animal. The real mime put a hand on the red man's cheek, and passed through, and the mime just held it there, as if to try and feel something. He was your friend, Delta said, breaking the silence like a dozen butterflies, the colors and sounds all fading away, as if some spell had been broken. The darkness was brief, but the mime looked. Terribly sad, as the vanishing and the red man pained him. He only nodded, and another scene appeared. Delta saw the young mime again, and gasped as the red man, still wonderfully elegant as ever, led him around by the hand. The young mime had his black and white makeup, but still dressed like a human boy at his age. A boy dressed in brown suspenders and white shirts with red ties. Delta followed the scene with delight, and the mime sat on the grass next to her, utterly happy as he saw the scene unfold. He tapped Alta and directed her gaze to something. It was a small sign next to the circus's main stage. A list of attractions was listed. The twin-headed ogre strongman with a sketch performer. At the same time, the half-siren and a half-magical banker. She sang about really good taxes according to the sign, and near the bottom was quickly drawn a sign tacked on. Rennie's silent show. Come see the ghoul perform with just a smile. Rennie, is your name Rennie? Delta turned back and the mime did a little half bow from where he sat. Nice name, how did you get it? Delta asked, wondering how the mime would explain without words. The mime simply pointed to the biggest sign of them all. Delta looked up at the sign until she was craning her neck. Raniard's fantastical and fabulous circus. The mime pointed at the man in the red and the back of the sign and smiled a smile that showed his many teeth. Delta smiled weakly, back at the sight and nodded slowly. He gave you his name. He, she paused in this, saw Reynard lift Rennie onto the small box and sat down and prepared a single chair. Now give me your best. I paid good money for this show. The owner of the circus winked at the young Rennie saluted and began to push against an invisible wall. Delta grinned as the young ghoul clearly was moving his hands slightly. Reynard's smile was patient, and he applauded as the young ghoul did a slight rope pull with a nice yank. Wow, you really needed to practice, Delta teased and turned to see the mime sitting on an invisible couch. Legs curled and back and relaxed. He tilted his head as if to ask her to repeat herself. Delta smiled and the mime patted the space next to him. Delta stood up and, with some excitement, sat down, crashing through the frickering grass on her ass. The mime stood up and bent over, slapping his knee. Hey, that was mean, she called as the scene began to fade again. She stood, but the mime's silent laugh was somehow infectious and she ended up chuckling. She stopped when the next scene appeared. Delta, Delta, where did she go? Rudy demanded and the orange growing cocoon surrounded the mime, preventing anyone from looking in. It was the scene that Nu had returned to. 
He groaned and flexed his stiff, aching extensions of himself, not using the feeling so out of shape. He looked around, confused, as he wasn't sure why he was here. There were people, and there were no challenges, and yet here he was. The loud child Dio was fishing out the golem, and knew was still odd, and that he stretched again. He scratched his nose. He sighed and then stopped scratching. Itching needed a nose, in which he needed fingers to scratch with it. He moved his hand away from his face and started to clumsily looking digits. He wriggled them, and indeed wriggled. My ones and zeros have become tentacles, tiny, meaty-looking tentacles. He said aghast, and he looked down to see two stubby things. Feet. He had flipping feet. You spun and fell over. There was a silence and New looked up to see everyone looking at him. He stared back for a long moment and then saw that his new shell was deep blue. It was a skin to Delta looked at him and lacking annoying bouncy hair and the flowy skirt. Hello! Dio waved and New spun and splintered. He gathered himself and spoke. <laughs> he managed. And the thing in his mouth flapping, he calmed himself and tried again. Hello, he said and nodded. Talking was not as hard as he rolled over to stand. It semi-worked. Master knew, Divina called, the box holding her breaking as she pushed. Rail, his stomach covered in a large growing bruise, kneeled next to him. Master knew, how is this possible? He asked, and knew could only ask the same question. Del Delta, where is Delta? He demanded, and all the boxes felt like a lost sheep, scattered out of the all four corners of awareness. He scowled and pulsed his power. Things snapped into view, his usual list of gains, losses, and potentials. He managed to stand, and a long tie flopped against his shirt. The intruder, mother, rail waved, and his hands and Dio looked at them, and the golem tilted its head, and the stream of water began to pour out its ear. You're new! I like your signposts, they give me good advice. Dio nodded, New felt his annoyance at the child and fade as he spoke with an honest truth, but then Rudy's shadow fell over him. He looked up and into the glowing eyes of the woman, her horns making the already intimidating figure more so. Where is Delta? She asked quietly and New felt her words settle around him like iron weights. She scowled and crossed her arms. Give me a second to get used to whatever stupid stunt Delta has done now, and I will get right back to serving you. I forget my place as your butler, he said and really raised in one brow. Sassy little dungeon thing, aren't you? She asked, tail whipping dangerously. New adjusted his tie and noticed his feet were flaking away rather fast. He felt relief flooding him. Soon he'd be back to his normal form. He moved and felt odd having to sight at the top of his form and not at the center. How annoying. How was he supposed to be aware of all of his spots if he could not see both around and inside out? No wonder Delta walked around like a blind duck that had his brain removed. The state was just... just... ugh. New scowled and looked at the glowing orange cocoon. He could feel Delta, her entire being focused on a single spot. Of course, she just jumped into something unknown, and I, of course, have to fill in whatever mundane tasks she usually performs, like being a mouth breather and pretending I like any of you. I want a contract, I want terms, he snapped and Rudy picked him up, his avatar flaking badly as she held him at eye level. Can you fix this? She contracted with the bloody mime. She snapped and new narrowed his eyes. Lady, I'm in no mood to put up with you. Put me down, or I'll do something unpleasant. He warned, and Rooney looked unimpressed. I'll put a damn timer on the pond, and you will have to wait between fish. He threatened, and he was promptly dropped on his ass again. He had a buttocks. Ugh. And the other dungeon menu saw him now. New wanted to bang the ground and screech at someone. Instead, he focused on the contract dome. The mime tried to eat her, and she employed it. I rather like her work ethic, but there is such a thing as planning or thinking, or maybe we can always get another mime that won't eat us. Fine, fine, let's see. He mumbled and tapped on the dome. It didn't yield, and New gathered his wool and focused. I am the substitute dungeon core. I demand my annoying core back, he ordered, and the dome ignored him, and the box appeared to him. So that was how it worked with the human eyes. Nifty. Authority does not surpass Dungeon Core Delta. Please upgrade authority. You. 
Excuse me? Mew squawked in distress, and he stabbed the box with his finger and smiled. That felt good, unlike jabbing things. He said aloud, narrowing his glare with a look usually reserved for Dalta stunt, and the box shifted. Please upgrade, authority? New narrowed his eyes and did what Dalta always did to him. He pinched the sides of the box and dinged an alarm as the dungeon system registered the contacts and screeches in distress. Jeez, even I can hear that, Rudy muttered and the box squirmed under New's tender touch. Dungeon system New has gained the title of Mean. The box vanished and New growled. He spun and crossed his arms again. I can't do anything, we just have to wait. He admitted and Rudy ran a hand through her long hair. Dungeons making contracts. Shh. Most people choose this time to utterly wreck the core or drain it since it does this. She jerked a thumb at the contract dome. Dio tapped it and Vass inhaled some of the flaking mana. New didn't like the golem. It wasn't anything personal, but the thing just didn't give off any mana upon its visits. If anything, it took a tiny amount. Loud one, take the freeloader and go back to the first floor. Ruli, you're hurrying and I need you to stop breathing in my general direction before I pass out. New commented and they all looked at him. The Venus sighed. Master New, manners are key in any sort of diplomacy. She offered and New's nostrils flared. He flared and then again with curiosity and then focused. I do not need diplomacy. I need utter obedience. New growled, feeling his emotions flare out. This body was so unwieldy. Ruli snorted and looked around. Now that I'm not fighting a killer mime, this is the second floor. She eyed the growing trees and the spreading flowers. The distant walls looked like endless jungle and roots. She grinned. I like it. I can hunt some real beasties in a place like this. She rubbed her hands and Lou watched as his legs vanished next. This form won't last long, but I may have more options for helping Delta if there are no people here. I would very much like to have her deal with you all the while I plot on how to drain you all of excess mana and sweat out your precious resources. He dismissed and Rudy scowled at the thing gave him a sharp nod. You're an ass, but sure. I ain't want Delta back as well. She admitted and gave the glowing dome one last look. She strode forward, her slightly clawed feet bursting from her tough boots, tearing the soil up as she walked. Mr. New, please make more signs. Dio waved and Vass looked at the dome with a long look. My master has jaws to contain things. Delta is nice and I still need to teach Mr. Mushi more art. I will ask for some pots for the dungeon to use if she will not destroy her foes. It offered and New didn't say anything. He just watched as Vass passed under the Wallum tree, his skin absorbing the green flaking mana. The golem stopped and then to smile at the tree dreamily and then hugged it before Vass climbed the stairs. Once they left, menus appeared and New looked at the options before him. Complete, hand out a control of how to arrange, change, and from the dungeon he would like. He could see exactly where to put coveted pits with spikes at the bottom, fill the river with them, grow mushrooms that could cause deep favors and vines that would strangle foes, make rivers boil for anyone falling in, add fish that would prune the skin off the bone like clippers on a bush. He could see exactly how to turn this paradise into a deep green hell, and there was a part deep inside of him that longed to do so. But as his fingers hovered over the trap menu, he felt an emotion rise up. I am going to make this place wonderful. Everyone is going to love it. He closed the menu and felt his new fingers shake as his body vanished next, blue mana flaking off to join the orange. This won't work, he said quietly, and his voice slightly lifting but firm. He looked around and saw Delta in very grass, and a patch of mushrooms and droplet of water. It all gave off a feeling of serenity, and New felt guilt curling up inside of him again. He turned and made a flower appear. There, are you happy? He shouted at the ceiling. The Vena and Rail just watched him. Waddles floated restfully nearby in the river. New just waited and put the pang on his lower gut and throbbed more. He was so painfully aware of how near death had been to death. I need to protect her. She's too stupid to do it herself. Nothing lethal, but I can do so much without killing someone. He told himself, and this seemed to spark finally a positive emotion. Anticipation. I mean, Delta won't be back. For who knows how long. I'm sure she won't mind me being worried for her and going a little crazy and set up some uh, harmless and interesting things. 
just because obviously I was worried. Nu said brightly and the last part of his face faded from the physical world as he had a wide grin. He stood there, only visible to himself now. The Vena and Rail shared a worried look and Waddles opened one eye. Entertain us. The words were not kind or were they threat that followed, unsaid but unheard. Dalton watched as the curious circus carriages and beasts were led down the long road and went underground. On either side were people. Delta could only call them that because they had two legs, two arms, but the faces and bodies were covered by robes and dark hoods. Any time a carriage moved too far away from someone, looked nervously towards the cave mouth. One of them seemed to inhale, and the people of their horses winced. Rennie pointed at the front where Reynard, looking much older, led the way with a grim expression. Behind him, and a much older-looking Rennie, almost identical to the one next to her, shared the saddle. The lion was a lead to the large man in a gleaming armor. He looked like a knight or some form of nobleman. If the men had such things as pupilless eyes and a hole in their forehead where something moved inside. Dalton could see that the circus had not entered such a place willingly. We take payments and manners when performing shows. Reynard called coldly and the knight put a hand on his chest as if hurt. My dear ringmaster, how very rude of me. Let me formally welcome you to the tunnel of the world. A grand title, but this homely little home is mine, so I dare say that I do some proper manners fitting of the lord of the path of the ending light. He bowed his head, tight black hair looking slick with the grime or sweat. He flicked his hand and Delta stumbled back, gasping as Rain had toppled from his horse, a knife buried in his throat. Rennie shook next to her, and the younger Rennie dropped down and picked up the grasping man in his arms. No! What is wrong with him? Dalton shouted, and Rennie only moved to sit next to her memory of himself. Rennie, my boy! Reynard gasped and then went still. Rennie and his younger self both pulled their heads back and opened up their black jaws wide in pain and anguish. A ghoul! So well behaved! Well, as they do say in business, on with the show. The knight smiled cheerfully, and the young Rennie turned, teeth bared and black liquid pouring from the tiny dots in his face. He slashed, and the knight stopped, hand to his throat, as if his nasty sliced open with an invisible knife. The scene fluttered, and Dowser fell to her knees. I, Rennie, I'm so, she stuttered, and the mime just looked up at her, wiping a single trail away from his eyes. His white paint neither marred nor smeared. He walked over it and helped her stand. He looked down at his hand and shook her head. He made a motion of gripping, and a knife then dropped it, and something unseen clattering to the floor. He looked so ashamed of the noise that he turned away. The next scene appearing, the last scene, something deep in Dalton knew. The orange and purple tent was in the cave, flat on the ground and not yet pitched. Rennie looked around the room as the collapsed cave trapped the circus in it. The young Rennie looked around and a few people alive, faces almost blurred beyond recognition. As Rennie himself had a large wound through his head, he didn't seem to be healing, and Delta listened as the screams made its way through the cave walls and the circus people went quiet. The scene flickered and time had clearly passed. The tent looked older, and the young Rennie held a weak woman in his arms. She said something, but it was too faded and distorted. She closed her eyes, and Rennie shook her and shook her, but she didn't open her eyes again. Rennie howled silently again, but he picked her up and took her to the near the back of the tent. Delta saw the people had all gone. Rennie shakily began to mime a shovel and dig. It was then that Delta saw little wooden sticks planted in the neat row, markers with names on them. The scene flickered again, and the tent had sagged, and a lot more, and all the lights had burned out. Rennie sat on the wooden chair, facing the tent opening. He sat there, guarding the now crumbling grave markers. Untouched by the ghoul, the younger Rennie also looked so thin. He looked over his shoulder, and black drool leaked out of his mouth and the grave markers, but he did not move from his station. He waited and guarded. He waited and guarded. He waited so long. Dalta rubbed her eyes and shook her head as Rennie put a hand on her shoulder. He was glowing and he shrugged as if to say, That's all, folks. Rennie, you won't ever be hungry again. She promised and the mime smiled, 
wiping tears away with a hanky that he mimed. Delta saw the scene fade and the menu appeared again. Do you fully accept Rennie as a contracted monster? Yes or no? Rennie eyed it and clicked the dirt with his hands and pockets, looking boyish as he grinned. Delta tapped it and Rennie's face glowed slightly. A red line formed some paint on him, and a human-shaped lips and could fool someone that Rennie's real mouth was there. Other than, he did not change. Delta was almost hoping for a beret. The light swallowed her and Rennie, and then she blinked. She was back in the dungeon. Davina was yelling about the bees and Rail was hacking at her wooden block bridge. What is going on here? She asked and everyone froze, including the other human boy. A person made a blue light. He opened his mouth and his hair looked mad as if he ran hand through it too fast, too much. Oh, you're back. Listen, I might have uh, done some things. The boy explained blithely and Delta stared back at him. He felt familiar, but the boy faded away and Delta moved forward, but a box replaced the human shape and text scrolled across it. Oh, thank heavens, I'm back in my box. No toes to watch, no tongue flapping, no nose. I can finally unsee those damn nose. I didn't even know humans' eyes could cross like that. How do you stand it? You demanded with his usual words and Delta sat down heavily, but she felt cushy chair being pushed under her and looked up to see Rennie grinning, bowing like a gentleman. I have a mime, my jungle is in chaos and new a set of boy parts, Delta mumbled. Davina walked over. Mother, the queen is very displeased. She muttered and the box opened up. Would you like to claim circus room 20 DP? Delta inhaled and exhaled very, very slowly. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 46, Ballad of the Great. Yes, I know, I know, I know. Delta agreed with the Queen Lizzie buzzed angry at the utterly theft of her royal honey. Cyril, her squirming larvae, wriggled with hunger, and the Queen seemed to compose herself and buzz softly. Delta floated near the crown of the stone pillar. The buzzing seemed to rise and fall in the lulling pattern. Delta got a rough just a bit. New just got excited, and I guess he lost his head. I'm having Davina fetch the honey as best she can, but a lot of it is already mixed into the pitfall hole soil. Delta explained. Rail moved the broken log to the field of flowers where it made a nice piece of scene, before he heaved a new one and the whole log bridge back into place. The old log had many holes and cracks running through, where New had uh, improved it. The vine traps and hoisted people by their ankles before they were already turned into a really nice scenery of vines. Rather oddly placed rocks near the base of the tree where someone might cut themselves free and land and break their ankles. Look more decorative than dangerous now. Delta felt a headache appear when she thought about the obvious fake treasure chest that Bob's pull. Placed, just so it was visible but out of reach. She simply pushed it into the bottom, giving it dancing crabs in the castle to rule for something for Bob to play with. She did not want to even think about the spring traps in the beds. It wouldn't kill anyone. New was careful about that. But people would need therapy or the noise of suddenly folding and the beds for years to come. This is silly. I was simply offering ideas where they presented themselves. New, go back to your corner, Delta said calmly, but without looking at the floating box. New moved to her face her. Delta, this was twice now that something that has tried to attack you. Three, if you think about the farmer. But that is not the point here. You can't just contract everything we unearth and that comes barging in. You have nothing but mud pit, a few goblins and Fran as a defense. Ori is adequate and the greater mushroom Bob are good. If they wander near the pool or down into the secret corridor. But the point remains, you are throwing caution to the wind if you die. And if it isn't you, I die, the goblins die, Fran dies, Bob dies, your stupid pet mime dies from hunger. Everything that is in this dungeon will simply fade away if you die. Delta hesitated as new words grew bigger in his box. But it all worked out. She defended it weakly and new just rippled. You cannot contract any more monsters. You began with three slots and got a mere one more when creating level two. Your goblins, the duck, and now Rennie. You cannot make more. Your valuable tactics of preventing anything and taking care of its needs come with a limit. Now what? 
How will you stop some monster killing us all by eating you? Do you expect Rudy to give up her life and defend you? Do you owe to live in the dungeon and forget his own life? Do you need to think about this, not just what you want? New blinked and vanished. Delta stared at the space and sighed, putting a hand on her face as if she wore off New's words. But she wasn't going to deny the fact that she came very close to dying when Rennie had appeared. If she hadn't glimpsed a number of visions and saw that glimmer of hope, Delta would either be dead or have really become a murderer for her. The queen buzzed and flew to hover near Delta's nose. The bee touched it and Delta felt a flash of connection. A dozen or so points of view filled Delta's mind, distorted visions of pollen and large petals, and the streams of flowers and queen followed between the voices as they all collected the queen's head. The queen made the choice and some of the tired bees flew further and further from the hive to gather more nectar. But they'll not make it back healthy if they're that tired. Delta protested and the queen twitched again, and a dozen or so wiggling eyes appeared, the heavy pang of hunger surrounding Delta, and she winced. But the babies will die if you don't make them, Delta whispered, and the queen moved back, feeling of regret and determination flow through her. It's not easy being in charge, is it? Delta asked honestly and the bee bounced off Delta's nose and almost chided her in a series of buzzes. Delta itched in the spot and looked around. It's all here because of me. If I go, it all goes. She agreed a new flickered into view with no words any scream. We do this together, no more of the mad genius crap. Delta said, eyeing him with a side look. I agree, I think. I'd like to apologize for assuming to know exactly what should be done. I stand on my intention, but not my result. Delta rubbed her nose and raised one eyebrow. Well, happens to the best of us. I made Bob after all. She reminded a new dinged. Bob is rather nice for a monster, so I hardly think you made a bad mistake there. Delta grinned, but behind New came a smaller screen that seemed to use New as a shield. Claim the circus? It asked, almost meekly, and Delta just stared and turned to New for an explanation. You shouted at us. It fled, and I argued you, until you sent me another corner. I didn't know that you could make me go. New looked annoyed, but Delta touched down on the ground. I shouted at you, not the system itself. Besides, what is it doing outside in a box? I thought you were a go-between. It already is kind of have enough trouble with enough floating boxes around. Delta waved a hand about, and New seemed to shrug, curving his shoulders as if he still had shoulders. It's a rather simple in explanation. You went into the contract term. Odd term, but I'll take it. You seemed to fully go into it, and there was nothing left behind to be the core of this time span, so I was temporarily pushed up the chain of command. So logically speaking, something had to take my place. The system was almost back to its natural state. It just needs you to confirm or deny this box, and things will return back to normal. I do not recommend doing that too often. I should add, a lot of things on the first floor, like objects, took damage, and a lot of mushrooms died off without a system to supervise the manner of the dungeon. It seems that there is nothing below the system that the totem pole of ours. Delta listened with a frown. The system was promoted? I accidentally made my menu a core and my system your helper. So what would happen if the system doesn't return to its place? She asked curiously. New turned to look at the smaller box with an odd noise. There is a good chance things will no longer work. There is an even better chance that things will keep working, but not in any natural way, and it will be beyond our control to stop. I heavily advise not messing with the system, or at least make sure that I have authority to access it next time you go recruiting. Noted and remembered. So now that we've all calmed down, we should really, Delta began, and Davina cleared her throat. Delta screeched and spun around with an accusatory finger. Davina, she scowled, with a sudden thwack noise come from behind her. Delta jumped again, spinning in an animalistic shriek. Rennie stood there with two sticks, smacking them together to make a noise. He tilted his head and seemed to giggle. Davina hummed. I'm still annoyed that you almost ate me, but I must say, good show, Davina admitted, carrying a clay pot sloshing with honey towards the pillar of the bees to swarm around. Rennie made a heaving motion, and the pot lifted up off the ground and rose as Rennie pulled the invisible rope. That made the bees' journey much easier and moved the honey as fast as they could. 
Data blew her hair out of the face and watching the frog of the mime working together to repair the damage done to the bees. At least they're working together. Grudges are so petty. Data slowly turned to stare at New, but the smaller screen moved closer. Claim the circus? 20 DP? Sure, I always wanted a circus. Just need a unicorn, a castle, and my prince. She said dryly and hit accept. The box twitched and a new option appeared. Keep the circus as a special room or convert all contents into resources. Delta knew the resources that knew had wasted here and it was hard to bear when looking at the numbers, but she looked at Rennie applauding a rather good flip from Davina and she caught the clay pot when it was released from Berenice's powers. She remembered the tent and the rocky hill and the sea of stars beaming down on it. It wasn't a tent with some axe going on, not to Rennie. It was home. The screen seemed to shiver and convert the option faded away. I understand, keeping room. It was nice to meet you, Delta. I I hope I can understand you better one day. New is lucky to speak to you. I will return to work. The box fizzled and faded away, and Delta shivered as the feeling ran through her, like something that had gone numb finally regained feeling. The system was back in operations. Delta could feel where it was now. Maybe because she had finally used the number world, or maybe because she felt like she was out it. She inhaled. New, can you talk to the system? She had to ask the dark corridor that contained the circus began to emanate a glowing light. Speak is a strong word. I can, well, I don't have the right word for how we communicate. Impressions is too physical. Thoughts are too clear and emotions are too out of the experience. We hum to one another. A number at a time, so fast it becomes a song. I cannot truly describe it, but maybe one day I can show you. I like that. I really want to hear the system's song. She smiled as New showed a shy side. That is if we still are alive until we get traps set up. Come, the circus reward is moist and there is a dungeoning still to do. Daltas laughed and she ran over New's screen and flew off. Davina looked at Rennie who tilted his head at her. Just accept him, they of the sun and moon, different but both beyond a grasp. She informed him and Rennie nodded seriously. And that is how I saw Rudy very horny as she beat up a mime. Dio Rounder exclaimed at the right smile, and Mr. Jones actually paused before his casual smile appeared. Very rude, Mr. Brondo, but this was about your review of the book I assigned you last week. The teacher explained, and Dio blinked and then nudged a furious energy. I like the end of the book because it made me think that I want a sequel. He added, Mr. Jones nodded very slowly. It was the history of the 25th war between the king and the queen. There are many sequels. It is currently on the 56th book. He explained that Dio looked extremely happy. It infuriated him. It made him want to scream. He sat near the front, a perfect essay and a well-thought-out criticism of the current feudal system and a refreshing sitting at 70 out of 100, while Dio got a hearty 40. A mere 30 difference, and that was all Screaming Idiot did, was talk nonsense about mimes and mushrooms. Drumnior picked a seed, his eyes to the comment near the bottom. Interesting thoughts, but it's still limited in personal biases. Also, this isn't due, I haven't even handed it out yet. Please wait until the homework is assigned before finishing it. He was simply taking the initiative and destroying the foe before he could grow powerful. Grum glared at Dio, walked past, graded paper stuffed into his pocket that he sat next to the gloomy-looking poppy and irritated Amster. He could barely restrain himself until class was over. He drew details and plans and theories while the minutes passed. Plans for when he came of age, Plans for the possible combinations of relics and magic to make himself utterly unbeatable. The right combo of nullification and countering magic. It was going to be perfect. Until then he had a very tactical sandwich with ham when he exited the school building. Eyes narrowing on Dio's red hair. The idiot screaming to the world and to no annoyed end. The world responded as birds sang and people waved at him. Grim moved fast and cut Dio off. The other boy passed and then smiled at him, utterly ignoring Grimm's level 4 glare attack. Hi, Grimm, he shouted, and the name made Grimm see red. Grimm, you bumbling buffoon, he snapped, and Amistad smirked at his reaction. Poppy just shook her head, but Grimm ignored them. Only Dio muttered. 
he struck out with absolute perfect ambush skills, practiced, of course, by sneaking up on annoying birds trying to eat red in the park. His fist grazed Theo's cheek, and the other boy beamed and nudged Grimm's face with some odd friendly gesture. Grimm saw the world spin, and when it stopped, he was in a bush. He just lay there for a while, and Theo's voice came over. I'll see you tomorrow, Grin. I love our secret handshake, but I think Poppy saw it. He warned and ran off. Grim watched as the sun overhead beamed, as if Dio's voice could control, even it, with its inane rumblings. It was unfair. It was so unfair that Dio wielded such power when he, Grim, could not even impress his teacher. He fought his way out of the bush and threatened it. It kicked him out and ran back to Dabagoth's garden. Grim scowled at it and then spun, glaring at the amused looks of people around him. Oi, stop fighting in the streets! A bored voice called out, and Grim saw Quiz Fire Smasher walk past without actually looking at Grim. He wanted to retort with something witty, but Quiz scared him so. Grim just glared at his back and then winced as his cheek bled. Not Dio's work, but the bush and its thorns. He opened his back and ripped a page out of the guides of various other guides and chewed on it. He winced as his body churned and the page became a lump in his stomach. It then finally spread out and he felt his cheek heal. Dio could shake the world with his voice and Grimm could chew on old copies of his dad's trashy romance novels and slowly heal cuts. It wasn't fair. He stomped down the road and tried to think of how to trick the local blacksmith into enchanting a book so that he could eat it and maybe finally get somewhere. His dad could eat any metal weapon and do amazing things. He used to eat spoons and do those embarrassing shows for Grimm when he was young and wanted a bedtime story. If he had that power, then he could stand equal or maybe even last longer than a second against Dio. He had just had to be better. Grimm slowed down and a quiet thought slinted into his head. If he had Grandpa Pick's power, he would win against Dio. But that wasn't how inherited powers work. Grandpa Pick had to eat anything. His dad could only eat metal because Grandma was a metal whisperer. Grimm's own mother was just normal, and Grimm felt a hint of shame for referring to his mother by that term, but compared to most of the town, his mom was just really nice and awesome, but she had no special powers. She was just mom. So why did his powers mutate like this? Why did he eat only books? Grimm stomped down the road, and Dad wouldn't let him get any good equipment, and all the rare books were gone. He couldn't find anything. The local bookstore didn't have anything beyond the oddest of books. Grimm wasn't even sure that he could do anything with magic books that he had to try. It was either that, or accept that he would never stand on the same world as Dio Brondo, and the stupid Dungeon Adventures. Dungeon Adventures. Grimm slowed down outside of the bakery, where the new woman in town blinked at him. He saw that she was nervous and he'd moved on quickly. Dungeons dropped loot. Loot was magical. Magical books, maybe. He hadn't given it much thought. Like the spirit train that had stopped outside of the town for a week and vanished after Quest started quoting parking laws at it, new things had to really make an impact to catch on his attention. But Dio had been there and seemed to learn a lot. Perhaps the Den of Wisdom was exactly what Grimm needed. After all, a dungeon challenges the person in the body and mind. It took them to their limits and pushed them beyond. It was a treasure trove of epic loot and cunning. Grimm felt a slow smile appear on his face as he chewed another page. The dungeon had to be the cleverest or strongest if it decided to risk appearing near Durance. Grimm was now running home with a gleam in his eyes. This Delta had to be some powerful, knowledgeable grandmaster that howled the answers to his troubles. I didn't mean to, Delta screamed at the newly formed guardian of the circus room and slammed down with a mighty roar. Stop doing things you don't mean. Also, guardian monster Tyrant Ape has been summoned automatically due to the special conditions of having a fur pelt of the beast inside the tent and having contracted the creature who was deep bond with it. Please tell Delta I said hi. The giant silver-crested ape let loose in a thunderous yell and the beat his chest as Chichanan jaw. Rennie rushed into the ape froze and the mime leapt at it. 
the ghoul wrapped his arms around the legs of the monster, and the ape inhaled through its nostrils. It wrinkled its nose and picked Rennie up with a flat look. Rennie mimed holding a ball and threw it. Something thudded against the wall and the ape didn't move. Delta watched, mind blank, as Rennie threw a ball again, and the ape sighed with a long, suffering noise and went to follow the noise with the motions of having done all of this a million times. Oh, goody, you brought back the mime's pet by accident. How that worked is making my head hurt, and I don't have a brain in any sense of the physical meaning, nor a head to actually hurt. So, well done. And doing two impossible tasks in mere minutes. At least he looks strong. Circus room is now available to upgrade. Delta whimpered as the mushroom popped up on the ground in front of the tent, and it seemed to shiver as the space to grow into. End of chapter There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 47 Delta Does Danger Circus Room. The room contains a large tent for show and to be held in. It is missing a lot of things to be a true source of wonder. Upgrade. Circus tent can be new and made with better materials, 10 DP. Add lanterns and shine with cursed lumen mushrooms to make lights for the cave and tent, 14 DP. Double the size of the tent, 30 DP. Need more options to add more options. Sorry, Delta. The box before her seemed to shiver as Delta closed it. It's not a problem. New Tell the system, I'll get on that soon, she said, feeling relaxed as she stretched, having just moved her core behind the circus to enjoy the benefits of the three mini-boss. Delta felt a lot better. The blood-curdling mushroom seemed to contain itself nearby, waiting for Delta to look away before it bred, no doubt. Delta pursed her lips and something tugged at her mind. The upgrade box had said something about a mushroom, a nice-looking lumen mushroom, Delta liked those. Her brain went up and beyond itself and pulled another tiny tidbit. New talking about the bees, how they could have multiple hives and cause a war. Delta's stare made the mushroom shrink down on itself. I can feel you plotting. It is distressing me. New informed her, and Delta fixed her fingers and checked her resource meters. Mana 15, deeper 75. Thankfully, New had dipped into her important DP. I'm not plotting new, I'm commencing war. She corrected as Rennie went about the tent, sweeping the dust off the seats and mimed broom. And giant ape beast lying about in its side lifted its entire four-row bench stand with one hand, letting Remy get a better axis. The ape had a good look around as his new space and seemed to look a little restless in the tiny space. Delta couldn't blame him. He looked like he was used to acres of wilderness to move about in. War, Delta... It's a mushroom. The words came with a sign Delta waved him off. New, this thing is following me and it's infecting everything I do. I need to work on defenses. My attitude about being the dungeon core, how to make this place a success, to make sure that it's not against us and the world. But before any of that, I have to beat this thing. Delta pointed with a jab at the mushroom. How do you intend to do that exactly? Delta opened up a menu and flicked with a grin. I kind of need to stop going after them like they are a mistake in the system. They're not. They're good little creatures who have to obey the rules just as much as anything else. I know that they can't grow out of control or block the way, so I'm thinking that it is time these little suckers had some competition. If I can't get rid of the damn things, I will utterly subjugate them with my own mushrooms. Delta laughed and the lumen mushroom spouted next to the black curdling one. It wriggled before going still. Delta leaned down and pointed at the black mushroom. I know we have never gotten on, and I know the system behind your existence is beyond anything I can understand. But I know that you can hear me. Stop breeding, and you can stay. If you infect anything else, the gloves come off, she warned. Silence answered her, and New moved closer. Delta, come now. This is becoming silly. It's a mushroom. I cannot understand threats or compromises. B. New went silent as a second black mushroom spouted near the first. Delta. Kill it. Kill it now. New, these guys are pretty powerful, speaking effect-wise. I think we don't need to erase them. Just cull them. She hissed and stroked her pretty lumen mushroom. Black curdling would only continue to grow worse at this rate. 
Comparing the two, the lumen mushrooms were never spread where it wasn't supposed to do, nor mutated without permission. It was a good shroom, and Delta needed it to act on her behalf. It just needed some additions. The contract with Rennie, the ape surprise, and the mushrooms, her guilt of not being a good leader, all of the rampant emotions firing through her after today, they all narrowed down into a single goal. Open the Lumen Upgrade menu, she ordered, and knew eagerly shifted to the menu that he sometimes acted like. Lumen mushrooms, they glow, and the weak white manner, very pretty. Allow mushrooms to keep glowing after being plucked, 3 dp. The mushroom can pulse gently, relaxing those who view it, 7 dp. The mushroom is warm with heat, making small spaces cozy, 3 dp. Mutate mushroom due to being planted on the second floor, 20 dp. Delta felt a rush of victory seize her as the options appeared. You know, it's not too bad showing some tough love. Delta mused and swiped her finger down on the entire list. The black mushroom shivered as the lumen mushroom glowed brightly. Yes, waging war on an infectious species by introducing an equally potential resource draining and potentially bigger threat is always what warms my heart in these dark times. The light died down and the simple cream covered mushroom now looked slightly different. The cap had become like a thin membrane and the holes so that one could peer into the core of the fungus. The single stem grew inside the cap now. At the end was a single point of light. It was brighter than the soft glow of the lumen mushroom had been before. It now pierced the shadows when it moved, casting the light through the different angles of intensities and the membrane. It was a star and it gleamed with a tempting light. It swayed slightly and Delta gasped as the light made the cave look mysterious, yet inviting. She looked down, grinning. Spread to the jungle, to the pool, to the bees. Shine your light everywhere. She encouraged and the mushroom light began to softly change colors and it became almost hypnotic. New silently switched to its menu. Starlight mushrooms. The fungus absorbs light and uses it in a night to keep other plants warm and alive. In return, the mushroom lures insects in and the scent and burns bugs as they come closer. It seems to dissolve them into some additional food. Delta turned and cleared her throat. Do not eat my bees, she warned sternly. The starlight only wiggled. Another grew out from the nearby wall, then the lure of the room only grew. Delta watched as two mushrooms seemed to point their stalks at the black mushrooms, pulsing with a blue light. I swear, if those blood-curdling mushrooms grow red star stalks to fight back, I'm going to get sued. Delta mumbled and perked up as she felt better. A rush of doing something made her want to do more. She spun as Rennie set a pile of dust, a heel almost bigger than Delta, aside the tent. And she hadn't known what that would claim everything in the room. Now that she had a special dungeon dust, it was going to be fun trying to think of a use for that outside of the pocket dust surprising attacks of her grubbers. The giant ape sniffed and then exploded the dust mound with a sneeze making Rennie go from porcelain white to chalky grey. He paused and then gripped something with his side and poured it over his head. The magic made his hat sink down as if suddenly soaked, yet no water dripped. The dust slid off of form and washed into soil. Odd to see it happen when there was nothing actually there. Rennie, how are you feeling? She asked and the mime put her hand on his chin to think. He nodded and patted his stomach, looking pleased. Good to hear it. Ah, uh, see. Si. Delta corrected herself before she looked around. So besides the war of mushrooms I just unleashed, can I do anything to make your space better? She offered and Rennie nodded and he beckoned her to follow and stood at the entrance. He turned around and then walked dramatically into the circus room. He stopped and peered unimpressed into the cave. He gestured at the empty space and the, the entrance. Delta looked between them and replied hesitantly, You want something to impress people. She guessed and Rennie gave him her thumbs up. Delta felt almost fluent in mime at this point. She looked at the large space before the tent and drew blank for a moment. She didn't want to put any old idea down. Not another tree or pond. This was Rennie's home, where his family laid resting. Delta blinked as her brain went for a record and supplied the thought that hadn't occurred to her before. Knew did we absorb the bodies and stuff. Rennie's family, she asked quietly and Noom seemed to rewind, scrolling back through the series of announcements. Here we are, the complete list. We got a lot of rubber, some good rope, good cage designs. 
an odd piece of very old popcorn or something like it. And yes, we gained a lot of human and other remains, far too decompressed to get another monster or anything too valuable other than some trinkets, which Rennie didn't care for and preserved clothes. That wasn't too bad. She would be a little torn and horrified if she'd gained them and some of monsters. The ape was one thing but thinking people. She looked at the space and smiled softly as an idea came over her. Sure, Delta would bring back the dead on purpose, but that wasn't the only way that she could see an old face. She flexed in her hand and felt her manner jumped as the goblins up above returned with more goodies. Same old things, but Delta was beginning to see each trip was bringing in less mana as Delta was absorbing anything new. New, why do I gain less mana from absorbing the same things over and over again? It's going to bug me if I don't know. Delta asked, and she began to picture how she was going to carry out her plan. It's not just taking mana and adding it to your core. Mana is like water where you can fill up your pond if you just keep finding more water. It's more complex because your mana comes from your very being. In romantic terms, your soul. Different beings gain mana different ways, some by just growing, others by experiencing in combat, or from working some profession, for example. For others, it's devouring the weak. The odd ones may complete tasks of the gods. Many ways to grow in this world. Ruri's diary even documents some cases of this, where she talks about feeling stronger after a fight. For dungeons, we become stronger by absorbing mana and using it to grow. Though, not by overflowing your current mana capacity, nor can you increase at such limits with gluttony. Nu took a moment to think before continuing, his box floating around where he was pacing. An acorn is a tiny piece of the world beyond. By absorbing it, your core understands it, how it works, how it grows, how it loves, what it cannot stand. You grow by learning how to completely understand what you eat. Like filling a book for research over a lifelong study of passion. What do you gain from eating the same creature over and over? What does a martial artist gain from fighting the same foe over and over, a chef cooking the same dish over and over? They gain less and less because they are taking so longer in the unknown or a challenge. Delta had stood there transfixed at news words before she closed her mouth. That makes perfect sense, but what about people? Dungeons keep eating them, she asked and new rippled with what looked like a snort. Show me another man exactly like Chris or a beast identical to Rudy. Scar me by showing me a clone of Dio, and I will cry. People, even siblings or twins, are so unique in their nature that even a bumbling drunkard with no redeeming qualities can still offer a tiny morsel of mana. The idea that you can create mana measuring system amongst people is sadly impossible. A bird may eat fry a fish, but in the end, it will be eaten by a giant spider because it flew into a web. Having more mana is also not just a clear-cut thing. A person with a unique or honed mana may fall short in measuring stick, but to us, a treasure, rare items and monsters as well. I think your mime would have pushed your DP into the hundreds easily due to his magic and nature. So odd. Nu looked and a little lost in thought, and Rennie put his hands behind his back and pretended to look abashed by the shy and Nu's words. Well, good to know. Shame munching on it easy, a cop-out, would really make this whole dungeon thing a joke. But it's alright, I took on this challenge knowing that it was going to be hard. I can do it by manner and manner. Delta bounced the spot, faking some punching at Nukes' box. Terrifying. I wonder why I had no confidence before. Alright, the puns. My puns are all I have here. I don't have any epic loot for people, so they'll just have to deal with mushrooms, my puns, and the challenge rewards, and some honey, Delta beamed. Don't forget about Bob. Oh, they can swim with Bob. Bet no one has done that before. She grinned and focused on the room. One grand sight coming up. Nu, no, if I think really hard about something, when I make stone, can I shape it, right? She asked, gathering manner. Yes, as you did with the beehive. Delta pushed, and the manor into the ground and watched it dip into low as the creation began to rise up out of the soil and rock next to the dirt path in front of the circus, a hand first quickly followed by the rest of the man. It rose to stand on a platform. 
Rennie's hands dropped to his sides as the rough shape of the figure of his father, Reynard, rose from the ground. The stone statue held one arm above him, holding his top hat. Delta narrowed her eyes and removed some of the rough edges. Without having Reynard's actual body in the system, she was going to be by pure memory. The statue held one hand out, as if to invite whoever was at the entrance to come lose themselves at the circus. The kindly smile of the man that Delta remembered best formed last. Rennie moved forward and jumped back as a hidden sconce of the statue outstretched hand erupted and the man held a cherry fire and the light the way to the circus. Delta was quite done as she formed a wooden sign to hung from the ceiling. She saw that it would be impossible to see without more lights, but her manner. She turned and nudged the starlight mushroom with her will, gently trying to see what would happen if she gave it mana. Time to live up to your name, she said with an encouraging tone. The glowing fungus shuddered and then a fair distance away, sliding up the wall, a new mushroom popped out of the rock with a pop. It shuddered a lot higher and another mushroom grew from a crack, each one glowing like a star, lighting up the room as it went, banishing decades-old shadows that this room had in it. The mushrooms finally hit the ceiling and grew outwards, becoming a sea of stars. Only a slight hint of movement giving them a way that they were actually were. Delta closed her eyes and added the last few touches. A touch of grass to grow naturally and some rocks to add charm. Then she stood back to admire her work. The circus on a slightly rocky platform, surrounded by nature that looked down on the sea of stars. It was the closest Delta could make to the room looked like night, and she put on a shy smile, turning to say something, but paused when Rennie wasn't near her, but kneeling in front of the statue. He put a hand on the base and held the statue firm. He mimed holding a knife in his hand and trembled. He breathed and coughed the statue. Delta felt the pinpricks and the knife in her mind. Rennie stood up before bowing low enough. At where Delta had been, his hat touched the ground. He was still and Delta moved closer to see the carving. Reynard, father and guiding hand of our costs, I love you, R. Rennie stood up and dusted himself off. He looked around and swayed to himself, as if he was unheard beat. Even the tyrant ape looked happier. I'm going to call him Wilhelm. He looks like a Wilhelm. Delta decided and Rennie shrugged. He waved his hand if names weren't the most important thing to him. The ape snorted and closed his eyes to sleep again. Must you name everything? Tyrant ape has a certain vibe to it. Wilhelm makes me think that we adopted a bear on a unicycle. Then my job is done. She grinned and opened up the menu for Wilhelm. Wilhelm the tyrant ape. Guardian. Allow Wilhelm to turn berserk and do more damage but lose control, 45 dp. Allow Wilhelm to change size at will due to a small room, 50 dp. He might make it part of his shows. Upgrade Wilhelm's stomach to eat blood-curdling mushrooms for the boost of attack, 30 dp. Delta smiled and left Rennie to get some more of the circus cleaned out. She felt a little done in but decided that she still had work to do. Delta stared at the entrance of a dungeon and looked around. She couldn't do too much here, but she was going to try and imagine how things looked for a new person's point of view. Due to her nature, as the dungeon core, being aware of the most of the dungeon made her zone out some things. It was personally walking through these halls and seeing what she could do to really amp up her first floor that would make all the difference. First things first, she said and eyed the open hall. New, show me what we got, she asked and the box appeared. Be warned, this menu is a bit, uh, different. Dungeon entrance, status unbound, exposed, re-entry, no claws for entering, no rule upon entering. Appearance, it's a hole in the ground. Sister Delta, it looks bad. Mana leakage level, it's a big odd number with lots of parts that I can narrow it down, I think. Alright, I'm gonna try again. Current leakage, rank 2. Yes! Would you like to change any of these? Delta stood there for the mind went blank. Yes, system show us some options before her brain melts. New interjected. Status change. Unbound. You are not bound to any buildings or land or creature. You lose a lot of benefits, but you can change your own dungeon location down the line if needed to change, or change how it is in the world. Making it fly or to have a walk and more. You do not have even enough nevels to do this. Exposed. Anyone can just look in. 
simply create a door to slide into place. Free entry. No one has to give up items of important items or items to appease you. Uh, due to how nice the core is, this is not currently possible as she enjoys people visiting, though setting up an outside donation box is possible. No claws upon entry. Set a requirement for entering the dungeon. This is important. I cannot see a way to remove such a thing once it happens. A clause must be something personal to the core. I cannot offer options. It does have a slight DP cost. DP? That's not too bad. Delta grinned and the system brought up a new box. Clause entry 1500 DP for one clause that seems to be heavily limited. For example, you can prevent more than 7 people entering at a time for 30 minutes between groups. I think that you can make people enter only if they sing a song, but the song can only be 5 or so words long. You need far more levels and experience to be able to fully make a powerful clause. Delta felt her mind go blank at the number, but swallowed back with a slight wail. So, I can do a door. She forced in the beaming smile, new dinged. Allow me. He took the last of Delta's manner, dropping it down a solid three, and made a large stone door. It froze near completion as the box appeared. Door must have an entrance or a way of opening. News box grumbled, and the stone door shuddered as the front became carved with a spinning dial. The dial had four layers and with words, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta written on all of them. In the center was an orange globe that seemed to gleam at the top and carved an arrow pointing down towards the globe. New, at least you didn't add a claw key mechanism. Delta said dryly, and New turned to face her. Your head has a lot more interesting things when you get thinking of traps. Wonderful, if not a bit odd. Delta, the word was the closest to the core in the middle. The door finished and clicked into place. There was a moment to wait before the door split open down the middle and opened. The orange globe cut perfectly down the middle as the door slid seamlessly into either side of the entrance. Okay, not gonna lie, that was neat, Delta grinned. Thank you, I originally wanted to put a bell outside and have the door fall upon them as a result, but I cannot trap the entrance as we know. At least the spiders will struggle with the lack of fingers. My condolences, Delta rolled her eyes and turned to walk deeper into the first floor. She shrieked and jumped back at a sign suddenly popped out of the side wall. A warning sign to let newcomers know, but sudden warning signs, new. Oh, I forgot about that. Delta was on the ground, eyes wide and heart beating fast. Well, why would you do that? She asked with a wave of her hand as the sign vanished back into the wall. It amused me. You got your mime, I get my signs. It's only fair. Delta blew her hair out of the way and then couldn't help but smile. You're going to scare someone to death before you even reach the first room, she said, not able to stay too mad at him. Oh no, how dreadful. To be fair, if they collapse at a wooden sign popping out, I'm doing them a favor and saving them time. The duck alone would do worse. Delta put her hands on her hip. My dungeon is not scary, she protested, as the glowing moss above him illuminated a room of webs ahead, tiny red eyes staring out at the scene silently, as if waiting for someone to come closer. Where the pond room beyond howled a dark drake, which guarded the secret tunnel to where her abyss worm rested. Delta eyed the spider room with the glowing red eyes and watched. The spiders were on their greed break time and enjoying the antics, apparently. Not much, she amended. This dungeon scares me, and I basically run a third of it. Delta couldn't really argue with that. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.